Will we be rewarded or will we suffer loss? That's the title of this teaching. And in it, I want to take some time just to reaffirm or reestablish, set more firmly in our minds the scriptures that basically remind us that this life that we have now as Christians, once we have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior and believe God raised him from the dead, that this life is now, in some ways, it's like a probationary period. You know, when I uh, hire a new employee, bring them in, we give them a 90-day probationary period. Why? It's time to test them. You know, I don't know that what they've represented on their resume or what I've found out through examination by calling past references is really who this person is going to be. I don't know how they're going to fit within the team that we have here. So we establish a period that's a probationary period. It's a time of testing. It's a time of trial. It's a time to see, is this person really qualified? Are they competent? Are they who they say they're, they are? They, they, they said one thing, but now are they really going to live up to it? You know, when we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we receive salvation. We receive that gift of Holy Spirit. The test is, is he really your Lord? You said it, you believed it, you've received the gift of Holy Spirit. Have we really made him our Lord? Is Jesus Christ really my Lord on a daily basis? That's what I mean when I say it's a probationary period. Am I really making him my Lord? Am I submitting to what he tells me I'm supposed to do? And there's areas of all of our lives where we haven't submitted. You know, I know that's certainly true in my life and I'm constantly seeking them out and I'm constantly doing what I can to change it. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 it says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That's why you have received the gift of Holy Spirit, to be holy and to be blameless. It saddens my heart with people that I know that I have personally brought to the Lord who have walked for a period of time with him and then left and are absolutely turned their back upon him. They're not walking holy and they're not walking blameless. But that's the purpose of what God has called us to do. He's given us this tremendous gift of Holy Spirit, this gift of salvation so that we can be holy and blameless before him. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, 29, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Do you love God? Well, I would say if you love God, then it needs to be demonstrated by how you live your life. Not love in the sense of the warm, fuzzy feeling sentimentality. Love, agape, in the sense of is your, are you so fired up on the inside and so devoted to God that it's manifesting itself out in the evidence of how you're living your life. How are you treating others? Are you forgiving those who have trespassed against you? Are you loving them with the heart that God has loved you? Because that's the measure. It says, as, as just as Jesus loved us, so are we to love others. As he has laid down his life for us, I am now to use the life that I have and lay it down for my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the standard. This is a probationary period. The testing is how are we living our life? You know, in, in 1 John where it says God is love and there is no fear in love, the context of that is that we will be standing before him and that we will be judged on how we lived our lives. Have you lived your life as a life of love? Are you being what 1 Corinthians 13 says, being completely humble and submitting? Are you walking with pride and arrogance? Is there rudeness in your life? Are you slandering brothers and sisters? Are you withholding forgiveness from those who've trespassed against you? If you are, I'll challenge you. You're not living a life of love. We're to be completely devoted to one another. How does that look? That doesn't mean that it's warm and mushy and sentimentality between us, but that love also rejoices in the truth and it has steel in its backbone. And when my brother errs, I love him so much, I point out to him. Just as when I have my, my children and when one of them errs, I do whatever is necessary to bring them back to redemptive living. If they're lying, then there's times where I might have to put soap in their mouth to break a pattern to get them to wake up so that they stop that. 
God loves us so much that he disciplines us too, to the end that he wants us to, to pass this probationary period. That's all this life is. It's a vapor, it's a wisp, and it's a probationary period. And God will discipline us in the areas where we need discipline so that we can live a life of love and be holy and blameless before him because we will be rewarded or we will suffer loss for how we've lived this. In Romans 12, 2, it says, uh, well, let me finish. In 8.29, it says, For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. That's what we're to be using this time, from the time of our salvation, our new birth, until the time that we either uh, go to sleep in the grave or the time in which Christ returns and we're raptured. This is a probationary period. And think of your life as this is the time of test. This is the time of trial to be conformed to his image. Moses, uh, look at Moses in Hebrews 11, 25 and 26. It says, he, Moses, chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. That's all this is, is a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. And for Moses, Christ was a future event. It was something he was looking forward to, but it was so real in his mind that he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Are you regarding Christ as of greater treasure than the treasures of, the, of this Egypt, this world right now? Because that's how we've got to live. You've got to make him so real for us that we can form ourselves and that even Moses was looking ahead, but we look past to the accomplishment of Christ. How much greater of a view do we have as what Jesus Christ did than what Moses, not even the, knowing the fullness of it. But yet that was so real for Moses that he gave up the treasures of this present world for that future hope. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10 through 12, it says, you then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's, God's judgment seat. You know, make no mistake, we will stand before the Bema, the judgment seat. And it's not gonna be a place where everything's just great and you're just, you know, it's gonna be this huge party. It will be for those that suffer or that, that receive rewards, but those that suffer loss, there will be punishment meted out. It won't be pretty for those. So use this time to convict yourself, to spur yourself, to move forward, to conform yourself. Jesus said clearly, if your hand offends you, cut it off. You know where he said that? He said, if your right hand offends you. The right hand is the hand of blessing. It was the hand that would be extended to others. It wasn't the left hand, the sinister in Greek the, or Latin, the hand of cursing. No, he said, if your right hand, the hand of honor is, is, is not you know, is, is, is keeping you back. Cut that thing off. You know, do whatever you have to do to conform, to present yourself wholly before him. I know we make mistakes. I, I make mistakes all the time, whether in my thoughts or in my deeds or things that I should do that I don't do. But get convicted, confess those sins, repent of it, and use that as motivation to spur yourself to try harder to be better. It says in verse 11, it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. We can pass this test. This is not something where God has put something so far out there that it's not achievable. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, it says, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is a love. Whosoever lives in love lives in God. You can live in love. You can do it. And where you're not, then can be convicted and change. Verse 17, in this way, love is made complete among us so that we have confidence in the day of judgment. Earlier in this teaching, I said the love in this section, the context of it was the day of judgment, our confidence. That's the whole point. God is love. He has loved me so much that now I can take that love and love others. And when I do that, I will absolutely have confidence in God 
on the day of judgment when I stand before the Lord of the universe and look at Jesus Christ and be fully exposed in him see my deeds. If I live a life of love, then I will have confidence. We will be rewarded or we will suffer loss based on how we love.